Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar, Revolutionizing Life Science, AI and Machine Learning in Direct Analysis of Dispersed Documents. Uh, before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded. A link to the recording will be made available to everyone after the event. It will be sent via email and posted on the Court Square Group website. Questions, uh, we will try to answer questions throughout the presentation. Uh, just use the Q&A button and uh, Keith and Brian will pay attention to questions and try to ask them in context as we go through the webinar. If you have any questions that do not get answered, we will re reply uh, via email after the webinar. Uh, so that's it for housekeeping. I'd like to introduce our two presenters. Keith Parent is the CEO of Court Square and founder of Court Square Group, and Brian Reynolds is the CEO of Doxonomy. Uh, Brian, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Keith, are you you want to? Uh... Sure. Keith, my name is Keith Parent. Thanks, guys. Um, CEO of Court Square. I started Court Square about thirty years ago. Been in the life science world for a very long time. Um, my goal today in this is, is working with Brian is to go over what we feel is something that's very important to the industry. So, um, Brian and I have been working now for a couple of years together. And one of the first things we want to talk about was how we can use AI in a real practical manner to revolutionize what you, what we're doing in the life science world. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we do that and why we got together. The way that worked is Brian's company is an AI company that deals with indexing the data and all the AI behind it and, and what we do around that data. Court Square is a managed service firm that manages infrastructure for life science companies. But at the same time, we've also got some applications specifically for content repositories so we can host a lot of that data. When I look at what we were doing and what Brian was doing, there was a, a kind of a match made in heaven where we have a lot of content, regulated content, both on the clinical and the regulatory side. And Brian has the AI techniques that we can use to more fully expand on not only the data housed within our regulated content repositories, but also other data, both inside of your firewall, within your other repositories, as well as externally. And I think that combination between a content repository and, um, an AI engine is huge. So I think the big thing for us is if I can take a content repository and I can add the capabilities of doing um, automated metadata mapping, if I can take that and I can do multi-language searching, if I can take that and I can do um, lots of other things around different types of documents or content. And when I talk about content, it could be documents, could be Word documents, could be PDFs could be Excel spreadsheets, it could be actually videos or other things like that. All of those things are content as far as we're concerned from a regulatory perspective. When you think about post-marketing and all the other things that happen there, doxonomy tools are instrumental in giving us the ability to see both structured and non-structured data. Our goal is to bring that data, the, the documents and the data forward while Doxonomy's goal is to be able to have you use that data in ways you probably never thought before. And I think that's really what we're trying to do today. I wanted to, as, as we're doing this webinar, one of the important keys that we wanna have here is Brian and I are gonna have a conversation. It's really gonna be around what we've seen in the industry, how we've worked with different clients, all the way from the largest sponsored clients out in the world to some of the smallest um, CROs or sponsors that you've ever seen. Um, at the same time, even we're dealing with some of the government entities like the FDA and other, other uh, governmental uh, entities that we can work with together. So I think from that perspective, this tool and this series of tools can revolutionize how you deal with some of the data you're out there. So why don't we move forward, Brian, with that start as a starting point. Do you wanna add anything to that? No, I, I think I'll, I'll walk through and uh, I'll, I'll touch on about three slides and, and start to explain sort of the back end and what, what this means. Uh, and then, of course, you know, at, we'll, at, we'll have questions back and forth and then take any questions from anybody else as well uh, in the webinar. So, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Great. 
So for myself, you know, just to introduce myself as well. So my name is Brian Reynolds. So I've been in this industry for quite some time, uh, coming up about around 30 years already that I've been dealing with unstructured data. That's always been the space that I've uh, spent my career in, uh, document management in particular, working with uh, systems like Documentum and FileNet and uh, SharePoint and oh, a whole host of others, as well as enterprise search solutions like Autonomy and Recommind and Stored IQ. And so I've, I've, I've implemented and integrated these kinds of solutions through my career all over the world. Uh, and I've spent probably the better part, uh, I would say 90% of that time in the life sciences industry, right? In particular, in top life science, uh, most of the customers I've worked with have been in the, in, you know, the big, the big guys, right? The top 20. So it's just, we really understand regulated content. We understand the fact that the data that is out there is mostly in an unstructured format, right? If you think about emails and you think about Word documents and, and Excel spreadsheets, and as Keith said, audio and video and all these different type of media types that are, that are out there, that makes up a lot of knowledge, industry knowledge across the organization that organizations have spent you know, millions, billions, trillions, possibly, right, in some large organizations on developing that knowledge over the life of the company. And it's, it sets mostly untapped, right? It's not accessible out there to uh, any of the workers, the knowledge workers that need to interact with that, regardless of what area, whether it be clinical or regulatory, or whether it's in manufacturing or in marketing, as, as Keith was saying it's across the board that information isn't there so one of the things that we set out to want to accomplish here when we when we set out to uh, develop doxonomy and then ultimately integrate this back uh, with regdocs 365 and and begin to you know put this entire platform together was to solve that that specific problem to use artificial intelligence and machine learning which became uh, very easy, I would say, to access, uh, taking uh, the, the ideas around linguistics and computer science and marrying those together so that we could use the tools like machine learning and natural language processing and natural language generation, LLMs like uh, ChatGPT, everybody's you know, hearing about that now, computer vision, uh, augmented analytics, all this sort of capability being able to bring that to bear in a very easy to consume and use uh, platform that companies could then streamline their business processes across. And we'll you know, Brian, you said a couple, you said a couple things there that I want to make sure that we point out to the audience. Sure. One thing that I think is important to note is Brian talked about different applications that we've heard of over, over the course of time, whether it's document or share document them or SharePoint or Viva or any of the, any of the different systems that are out there. They're all systems in and of themselves. Each of us is probably very adept at using different systems. One of the major problems that we've always seen across those systems is that they're silos. And I think a big part of one of the reasons that it's important for us to think about this today is that everybody's got these big, massive projects um, sitting on the table where they're, they're pulling all these data, this data out of all these different systems so that they can actually look across their systems and figure that stuff out. Well, that's an issue. That's the kind of stuff that we're thinking about. And when we look at AI, and Brian's going to get dig, dig, dig a little bit deeper into some of the AI capabilities. When we think about AI, I think about how can AI be a practical solution in this industry? I think about the clinical operations folks that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I think about the regulatory operations folks that have to do all the submission processing across lots of different documents for different modules. All of those, the sources of data come from different departments. They're usually not in the same system. Well, that makes life so much harder. And one of the, one of the things over the 30 years that I've been in the business, I've just recognized the fact that we're always trying to add efficiencies across the board. And in reality, most of the operational folks, because they're siloed out, actually add more inefficiencies into the process because we're trying to hone our own data in different areas. And I think that part of what we're talking about here is how can AI help us across, thing, across repositories to, to actually solve a problem? 
with that being said, Brian, why don't we kind of get dig into you yeah, know, that's what a, makes that's that a, special? Yeah, that's a perfect segue right to the next slide. I mean, what you were saying is exactly right. We have repositories that exist throughout the organization that hold all kinds of different, you know, data sets. And some of those may be structured and some of those may be unstructured. In fact, the majority of them tend to be unstructured as we've learned over the years. And these repositories hold business processes that, that are running your organizations, right? They're, they're, they're each one, they have, some may have multiple processes, some may be specific to just one process, but the idea is, is that data lives out there. And the, the power of this, this tool and this capability is that we can connect to all of those different repositories, regardless of where they are within your organization, internally and externally, because we can connect to external repositories as well, and be able to crawl that information, right? Go across it, look at it, analyze it, read it, without affecting, changing, or touching, or migrating any of that data, right? We can leave it where it is and let the business process continue to run. And then we can ingest sort of that index, we call it an index, right? Bring that information in and then begin to apply the AI to it, analyzing it, extracting what's important, you know, re reading it like a human would read it and building out something that becomes super powerful to the organization and ultimately to the knowledge work of the person that has to interact with this data on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's great. Can you go back to that last slide, Brian? Because I think there's a couple of points that I wanna make sure that we talk about when we're dealing with this stuff. Could you just kind of go down that right hand side and talk a little bit about each of the different areas that 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 today the way we look at things. Sure yeah so so when you think about when you think about machine learning as a whole right that's just the ability to take uh, very powerful computer systems and very uh, powerful algorithms and apply them appropriately in a very uh, sort of linear way to analyze and look at a lot of information. And, and, and so we take that capability to apply things like natural language processing. Natural language processing is nothing more than being able to read text, right? And, and create context out of that text, being able to understand what it means in, in, in contextual you know, uh, response, right? Uh, of what's been written and be able to pull that out as meta information, right? It's the ability to understand that. Speech recognition is nothing more than being able to take audio, whether it's coming from a video or from a podcast or whatever may be the source of that audio and being able to interpret what it's being said, regardless of what language it's in, convert it into a textual based format that it can then be put back through the machine learning process. Right. So we need to have the ability to deal with that computer vision. It's like a human being's vision, right? Looking at an image and being able to predict what is in this image, right? What's going on inside there? Or if there's text in an image, being able to extract that text out of that image that maybe is buried in a video, right? So, and then of course the deep learning and the augmented analytics, those are aspects that come out of the entire process. The ability, because you do these types of things, you can now make decisions. You can now generate new language. You can now you know, create new business processes off of this new intelligence that you didn't have before. I think what's great is the fact that Brian and his company and his team of, of specialists really understand the concept of each of these different areas. And there are specialized companies out there that that's all they do. What was great to me was I know about these capabilities and I've wanted to use some of these. The reality is I don't need to be an expert in it if I know how, if I know somebody else that that is, we are an expert in what we do, and that's around the content itself. Having the expertise of the of where the industry is going from an AI perspective and joining forces together is a powerful statement, and I think that's the kind of things that we're really excited about. Right. Absolutely. So let's delve just the uh, one last slide here, and then we'll kind of get in and, and demo it, and I'll let you see, you know, the application, uh, let you see what we're talking about in in reality with real content. Uh, but I think it's important to kind of understand um, a little bit deeper about what's inside of those those blocks. Like, what are the real keys? How do we take text and com convert it into context? So these are really sort of the key cogs, if you will, the the, the engine points within. The platform that do the things that it needs to do so you have 
NLV, uh, NLP vision, classification, transcription, similarity, and question and answer. So what does that mean? Well, as we said about NLP, it's about reading and interpreting and understanding huge volumes of text at scale very quickly to determine what it what it is, what it's about, and what's you know what's really key and important there. And, wh and why is that important? Uh, let me let me let me give you some practical examples. I sure. think of these things when I'm talking with with our whether they're sponsors or CROs. When you start to think about NLP and how is it used, well, we had an issue where we were trying to figure out how do we get on a, on a form 1572, which is part of doing a clinical trial, all your, um, your PIs have to put their information on there, your sub PIs. Well, there happens to be a box. It's a structured document, but there's also some unstructured capabilities on there where there's a block of text and an admin, an admin person can, can actually put a person's name in there. They can put first name, last name, last name, first name. Every time they submit a new one of these, it could be in a different format. Well, using natural language processing, we can grab that and look at that and put it in the right context and understand how that name compares to other ones. Absolutely. Another another case would be, let's say we have a correspondence coming in, an email message that we've got coming in from a regulatory authority. If I can use natural language processing to go through that correspondence and identify questions that they that the authority may be asking us, I can then enter that into my RIM system as a commitment that we have to find out. Using natural language processing, we can identify what could be a time in there or a date that they needed responded by. We can then set an alert by it. That's where AI can be really powerful. It can help take those things that you may miss as a human and drive those things to, um, to fruition. Absolutely. Yeah, and then on the vision side, we talked about you know being able to analyze and look at content look at images look at uh things that are in a video for example frames because those are nothing more than pictures right or any kind of imagery or mo monitoring say let's uh, say a, a manufacturing process you know we can analyze video across that manufacturing process and look for anomalies that stand out say in the video run stuff like that i mean the ability to be able to do that lives within an engine like this so let's talk about a practical example there. So a couple of things come to mind really quickly. One is what if I'm using that vision processing to actually take in an OCR, optical character recognition, a form that may come in from a quality check. Let's say I've got a lab form and mm -hmm. I need to look at it. Has, has it been filled out correctly? Does it have the right signature on it? All those kind of things. Yep. We can use that vision processing to look at something like that. Absolutely. What if I've got an application that has gait analysis and somebody's walking and we're trying to decide you know, where it is. Can I pull that out of uh, that? That's where some of those vision systems come in and how AI can be important there. How about post-marketing when we have those videos that Brian just talked about? If you're out there doing commercials that are out there and I can process that commercial and find out is somebody talking about a, a, an off-label usage? Those are areas that we think about, particularly in this industry. Absolutely. Yep. Perfect fits. On, <clears throat> again, as we move on in this, on the classification side, this actually deals with the ability to sort content, right? So uh, today, or you, you used to be, I would say, because it's it's changing quite quite rapidly. Uh, you had to enter metadata. You put a document into a doc management system. What kind of document is it? You know, is it is it a, a prescribing information guide? Is it a clinical study report? You know, you had to classify this content. Today, with our with with the power of these types of intelligence engines like we have here, we can sort that out automatically. We can actually read the content, and because we contextually understand the content, we can make predictions on what that content really is, and we can sort it out at at, at again at scale. And on top of that, when we're reading it, we can actually pull meta information out. So if you think about uploading a document to a Viva or a Documentum or something before in the past. You had to enter in all these properties. Sometimes it was, you know, 20, 30, 40 fields they wanted to enter to in order to be able to classify and group that document appropriately. All of those things can happen automatically just by reading the content itself. All that data can be lifted and automatically applied as a property, if you will, a, a metadata property. We call them entities. Now this, let's take let, let's take a couple of cases in point, Brian, to to, to sure. show people where that practically would be used. Let's take the TMF, the trial master file. How many of you pull data back from a clinical site? You have to look at that document, you open that document, 
try to figure out where that document goes within the TMF, what zone it goes into, all the different characteristics from a metadata perspective that you need to for that particular document. This tool with the auto classification capabilities can actually look at that, find and read the content of the document and identify how to classify that. That's one example. What if I take that same example and I use that for um, submitting to the FDA or submitting to a different authority and I need to put it into module one through module five? Can I do the same thing with a whole bolus of documents that I may get from a sponsor to be able to look at those documents? That's the same kind of concept. Why let why rely on people to do that who may not get it right? Let's use AI that can actually do that first pass at it and then let the people who, who are trained in it verify it. Let them be the QC on it. Keep that human in the loop as we're looking at that stuff. That's practical examples of how that can be used. Absolutely. And then the next cog sort of in here is dealing with transcription. And transcription not only means you know, converting, uh, say, audio to text, but also translation, converting from language, you know, French to language English and things like that. And we'll see examples of that in the demo today. But uh, basically, it's the power of being able to convert things that are not in traditional textual based format or are in languages that you maybe don't understand into a language that you can process and you can analyze and the system can, you know, do things with. Well, and I think some, some practical examples here, both on the transcription side, as well as on the translation, when you get, when you do transcribe that, are you could have an interaction between a clinician and a patient, that could be a video or that could be an audio file that, that somebody has, you could then transcribe that and using AI on it, identify different metadata elements within that, and also um, translate it into appropriate language. So you could actually have an uh, you know, if, if you're dealing with multiple countries and you're trying to pull that information back together, that's a huge opportunity for you to be able to uh, tie some of that together. Again, I think we talked about the post-marketing aspect and taking a video that's out there and transcribing that video. Huge sure. opportunity there to to look at things after the fact. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we can even see some of that when we get into the demo. The next piece around similarity, this is an extremely powerful component uh, within an intelligence engine. Uh, that exists within this one and that's the ability to understand uh, similarity not only at a document level but at a phrase level and at a word level right so everything within the system as it gets processed is being analyzed it's being put into a very powerful index you know from a complication standpoint it's super complicated from an end user standpoint it's very simple we can make similarity much like you would do uh for example when you're uh shopping on amazon right you're ordering something and uh, and it makes recommendations based on what you're ordering it's the same sort of concept but instead of you know products and so forth that you might be looking at on Amazon, you're looking at content at words, you could say like where, where have I used this phrase and what what documents and what repositories is this phrase being used, and not only exact match, but where it's evolved over time and the words have changed a little bit, I can still identify and find those with similarity. And I think it's important here, Brian, is that the whole industry right now when you're thinking about structured content, and you're looking at uh, consistency in the way that we're going to be using, what, maybe it's your medical writers putting together your submission package. We want to be able to take snippets of data. Maybe yep. it's an IDMP project that you're doing, and we want to make sure that we've got uh, consistent content across the board that we're going to plug into a structured document. Those yep. are areas where the similarity, and I think what's really cool about this is you've got it where similarity could be close to similar. And I think those are things that you're going to show later, which I think is fantastic because I think those are the things where you can open up your mind when you start to see your own data in that same context. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. The ability to find what we call near duplicates, right? It's easy to find a perfect match duplicate, but what if only a date changed in the document? That's not going to come up as a perfect match, but we could still identify it as a near duplicate, meaning that it's still pretty much the same. It's only off by you know, very little. And so we can identify that with similarity. So that's very powerful. And of course, all this leads to one of the most important pieces. And, and of course, today in this day and age, everybody is, is reading about and hearing about, you know, AI and hearing about 
uh, you know, the chat GPTs of the world, if you will, that are that are going to, you know, sort of transform everything. Well, that con that exists within a platform like this as well. But what's more important about it is it, not only is it able to answer questions like where was this manufactured or where what stage is this in? You know, you, you can literally interact with your data and speak to it uh, and have answers come back with pointers directly back to the source data but that it's not in the public domain, right? We crawl all of your information. We build an index that lives behind what we call your firewall, right? It's not in the cloud. It's not out in the public. And the answers that come back are not answers that are generalized across you know, public information, but your information specifically. So it's much, much more powerful than the traditional sort of uh, you know, public facing you know, chat GPTs, LLMs, they call them. Uh, but we have that capability built in and it, and it works with your information. And I think what's great about this particular one, um, Brian, is the fact that when you start to think about people using chat GPT and they're using basically data that's been, been gathered from across the internet, across all these other sources, having that concept inside of your own firewall and doing with your data, now you start to ask questions about your data let's say I'm a large pharma and I've done, you know, thousands of submissions. I've got lots of data back from the FDA documents that we've put together. If I can ask questions about not only my successful submissions that, that we passed uh, and we got approval on, what about the ones that, what are the, what's happened for the ones that we didn't get approval on? What are things that we put in there so we can avoid doing some of that stuff? I think that, that kind of area that can build into your whole risk strategy of how you answer questions or how you submit your data or how you put your data together. So I think those are new areas that are that AI is going to really open up for us. And the nice part is you can ask a question in such a way that it can generate an answer that can be a starting point for you to do something going forward. And I think those are the areas that that we're most excited about from this this perspective. Yeah. Whether it's whether it's developing a protocol or doing whatever you're going to do as part of your job, it's an area that we can start to work on. Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, we've kind of hit on the things that we wanted to sort of talk about, you know, from a slide where I think the best thing is, is to kind of get in and take a look at, you know, the technology. Uh, and we'll hit on some of these with some basic queries with data that we have in our system and show you what it looks like so you can get a, a feel for it. So I'm going to switch screens here for a second. And again, same thing, Keith, feel free to ask questions as, as we go through this. Right. Let me know if you, uh, you should see a search screen right now. We see it. Okay, awesome. So when you look at the platform, um, you know, the idea behind this is, is that, you know, we're so accustomed today, all of us in our private lives, right? When we leave work, let's say, is to have a, a, a interface of Google, right? We can get answers to questions immediately, no matter what the, what, what the case may be, whatever we're looking for, you know, what time is the movie at, where, you know, how do I make this certain recipe, things like that. We query it into our phones or to a computer and boom, we've got an answer back. And so, and it's changed our lives, right? It's made everything easier. We have much more knowledge at our fingertips. But when we go behind the fire, when we go into your organizations, right, that experience completely goes away because when you want to go look for that information that's siloed, as we said earlier, in all these different repositories, it's extremely hard to find. This brings that experience for you right behind the firewall. So you have the exact same type of experience. So we made it. Uh, starting out in a way that everybody's used to. It's a search bar, right? So it's easy to interact with. It's much more powerful than that, but it's a great starting point. So it's easy to learn. It's easy to get up to, up to using the tool after the data has been crawled. I'm going to start out here real simplistically, and I'm going to do a query, just a simple query. I'm going to query for uh, a particular product, Zeralto in this case, 2.5 milligram film coated tablet. And I'm just going to do a search. And so when we do that query across the, repos the demo repository here, we're going to get back results, right? So immediately we see documents that are starting to come back. In this case, we've got six results back. And I want to kind of explain what you're seeing on the screen. So this is a search screen, right? So we see the different documents that come back. We see what we call snippets. We see highlights within the content because it's been analyzed of where the hits are relevant contextually. What you also notice on the right-hand side here 
is a very powerful aggregator. Okay, so we can go in and we can filter and we can sort on all these different uh, values and these are all discovered. No human being had to go in and set up and create these or enter metadata. They were discovered by the system and then made available as filter uh, you know, attributes from the content itself, right? So this is a very powerful way to sort on this. So you could, for example, go in and say, okay, well, I want to open up, you know, side effects, and then I want to sort on specific side effects, or I could say, I want to, you know, look at, you know, indications. I could go, I don't have any indications in this particular one, but let's say inactive ingredients. Okay, I can look at that. So I can set these filter values and then I can further refine my results. Again, you're thinking you're crawling millions of documents and the results are quite large, right? So this is a way to very quickly get across that kind of data. Now, for purposes of, of our demo, I'm, I'm gonna actually hone in on one in particular and uh, we're gonna actually open up um, this guy here. So what you'll see here in this case, this happens to be an SMPC, okay? So this document was auto-classified, all right? So we can go over here and look at it and we can see that we came back with a prediction of 100%. It was probably more like 99 point something, but it rolls up to 100%. So its prediction was very, very accurate, but it was predicted. When this document came into the system, we didn't know what it was. The system determined what it was based on, on that. Of course, if, if you need to make adjustments, you can go in and you can choose and change it. And there's a feedback loop and all of that. It is a knowledge system. So it is always getting smarter when it does make mistakes. They can be corrected and it learns from its mistakes. Um, but that's sort of, you know, kind of the idea here. You can also see over here on the left hand side, this this pain we call in, intelligence. OK, this is all information that was pulled out. Now, if you think about a file when it first comes in, there's the traditional properties to create date, modify date, all that kind of stuff. That's still collected, of course. If it came from a source system like a Documentum or a Viva, any meta information that lived in there, we would grab that as well at the time of crawling because we want to have all the information. But then from there on, everything else that you see here, that was discovered by the intelligence of the engine. So in this particular document, excuse me, ATC codes are important. I can open up and I can show you. Here's where we found the ATC code. It was discovered within there. I could also say, well, what was the active substance? Okay, well, I can identify the active substance as well and anywhere where it would have showed up. So these types of things are found like a human would find them, but again, at scale with the machine. Brian, we had a question come in. I just wanna, I think you've already answered it when you talked about the file metadata and the provided metadata, but somebody asked, what if I already, what if we have metadata that we've defined in our system? Can we identify that and make sure that it finds content based on that metadata? Absolutely. So that metadata would come in through the provided metadata, depending on the source system that was being crawled. We crawl numerous source systems. Um, you know, there's not really a limit. Uh, hundreds, to be honest. And so depending on that source system and what metadata was captured in there, let's say uh, SharePoint, for instance, right? And you have fields in SharePoint on the data, we pull that data over as well and it would show up in here and it would be part of the index. Right. So that's just kind of a, a gives you a quick lay of the land. Um, of course, we give you a, a textual based viewer here that lets you very quickly isolate, highlight and identify. If you wanted to point back to the source system and open up and see the original content, we would be able to serve that original content back up. This is the PDF document itself that came in and that was processed, right? So we have a pointer back to the source system. It's not a, it's not a copy, right? We point back to the source system. Uh, if you needed to share this content with somebody, we have the ability to to share content. We have the ability to, uh, uh, you know, uh, create links around it. We call it linking. So we could go in and create a quick link for someone internal. We could create links, you know, external and then give somebody access and give them a pointer back to the content. We can also tag content so we could pin it and it would show up back in what we call my files. Or you can go in and create more complex tags if you're running a workflow and you're trying to define and, 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 and build you know, a tagging mechanism and share it amongst a group. All that kind of capabilities built around the index for, for access. 
Uh, if we click on the My Files, for example, if we pin that, you could come back and see these are some files that I've got pinned in my particular My Files. And actually, that actually is a great segue to, you know, talking a little bit about language. Uh, you know, here's a document here that actually just... before you before you move sure. on to the language, Brian, we had another question that came in. Uh, again, it was it was focused around that metadata. Yep. What if the provided metadata is hosted in a proprietary system? What's the effort to pull that in? How do you how do you kind of set that up? Um, so the metadata. So in the proprietary system, uh, you mean a like a homegrown system? Let's say like a yeah. A, let's 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 custom, take that a custom system. Yeah. So. If that system has APIs that were developed when it was put together, we'll we'll build a connector specifically for that system. So we can we can build custom connectors on the fly, uh, and and then we could integrate with it. If it has a data source like a like like maybe it's running on top of the Oracle or you know Microsoft SQL or something like that. Uh, as long as we understand the structure, we have connectors that can connect to. Uh, databases as well, and so we can put queries in there and literally create joins and pull data back that way. There's a lot of different ways that we can get at that information, but we haven't found a source that we can't crawl yet. Great, thank you. Hopefully that answers the question. If it didn't, please just rephrase your question. Yeah. So, you know, segue as I open this up and I kind of saw, you know, there's a document here and I think this is a great, you know, segue to understanding the transcription side of it and the translation side of it. This is the prescribing information uh, guide, okay, that we identified uh, for this particular drug. You can see here we predicted that the language was in Japanese and again, if we look back at the source system and look at the source content, we'll see that this was in fact a Japanese document. Okay, that was that came into the system. That's its native language and that's the native document. But we automatically transcribe that document to English because that's what our system does. And of course, if a person was sitting here saying, oh, well, I need to see this document in French. Well, they could open this up and they could go down and choose of the 104 languages that we support and they could translate it immediately into French. So the machine learning uh, a model that lives underneath that does our translation uh, can actually take that text and then translate it on the fly. And then we keep renditions of that. And of course, this is not what I would consider a, a certified translation. Uh, it's for, you know, for usability, but we do have the ability to support certified translations. So if you do have translations that have already been uh, done that you've paid uh, to have done that are, that are, they can be added into the system, there's a place to store them and we'll serve that translation up as well. Um, so that's a little bit about translation. Let's see, let me look at our demo. We want, we wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, also about LLMs. Uh, that was just another area that I thought was important while we're in the text. Oh, there's another question that came in. Does the product come with, uh, pre-trained models for classification and metadata extraction, or does it learn on its own while it indexes the data? So we do have, uh, a life science, um, uh, framework that can be applied uh, comes with the with, with the platform. Actually, have other frameworks as well, but uh, in this particular context, it's a life science that gives you pre-trained models. Yeah, so a lot of this information that you're seeing here, everything that's out of the box. Like what we're discovering right now, that comes out of the box. The ability to identify those things, and we have a lot of pre-built classifications that already come with it, pre-shipped for classifying. Now. There's always extra extra document types. There's data that isn't part of, say, the public domain that we don't have access to. It's not hard to train new data either. We can uh, we can add new models. We can load dictionaries. We can. It's it's quite configurable on the back end. Uh, it is it isn't a customization. It's a configuration to do all of that work. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, so I was going to go back over here. Actually, let me go back to uh, to this Zeralto document. And let's say, for example, uh, you want to you're looking at something, and maybe you don't completely understand, uh, you know, what that particular uh, context is about. So actually, let me go down, and I'm going to jump to uh, let me jump to this section. This is a warning on pregnancy. Here we go. This is a, this is a good area here. Let's say. This particular data here is something 
you're not quite sure or understanding it. So it has the ability to do summarization. So I could go in and say, okay, I want to summarize this. This is configurable. We set this up for demo purposes. You could choose a level. There's a lot of different ways you can configure this. So sky's the limit, but this is really tying into the LLM side and say, okay, I want to summarize this down to an elementary level. So I can go ahead and click on that. And you'll see here in a second, it'll query out to the LLM and they'll say, sure, let me simplify that for you. And it'll begin to rewrite the, the complexity of that down to a simpler level. And again, this is just a way to demonstrate you know, the, the, the technology, but the sky's the limit on how this can be used and drive business process forward. You know, it's funny, Brian, I saw a number of years ago, there was a hackathon that one of the major farmers had put together. And it was interesting because their concept was, how do I take this very technical jargon of a label and put it into a very simple way for a human, uh, you know, a, a grade school person to read it or a high schooler to read it? Sure. You've already put that into the application, which is fantastic. Yeah, we've built that in the application and we're doing a lot of extensive, uh, we're adding a lot into the application right now, currently where we're working a lot with uh, the EPI and fire formats uh, in Europe in particular around standardization and being able to process that data and, dry, and, and simplify, do exactly what you said, take complexity, simplify it down and make it easier for the patient, if you will, right, to consume more complicated information in a way that, that makes sense, but yet still have access directly back to the source content as well. So excellent. Um, let's do let's do a search. We did talk about like um, uh, multimedia type searching, so I don't want to miss that. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, jump over and do a search uh, on on like multimedia data, uh, based type stuff. So we have some videos loaded in here. I'm going to do a query here for uh, low blood sugar uh, and, and sudden kidney problems, right? And, and, I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna query this on, on purpose because it's going to uh, go out, do a query and come back. And what's gonna happen is we get this video back, right? So we've identified a video where it's talking about this and I'm gonna jump in there and open that video up. And you'll see what happens is we jump into the source and we can see right here that we found this hit, right? low blood sugar, sudden kidney problems. This was identified inside this video. And it was, this video was just uploaded as a video, right? There there's, was no transcription with it. The transcription was done automatically by the system as it processed it. We can jump to that segment. Low blood sugar and sudden kidney problems. Stop taking first. So we can see basically that you can do that type of querying inside of a video. So we break the video down, we understand everything that's inside of it. And so it's very, very rich and very deep in which we analyze and look at content. It's not just text that comes in and you know that's what you get. It, it is very much you know, knowledgeable and understanding what's going on. Think, of, think about Brian, if you work in the promotional materials, organization of a large pharma company and you have hundreds or if not thousands of videos around your products and you want to look at similarities you want to look at different things around those products i think there's a, a huge opportunity there to be able to to use a tool that can actually go out across your entire domain and look at all of those documents in one fell swoop index them all and give you the ability to search across them and say hey find me the things that are that are around this or what have we done in the past that we may want to reuse? I just, I just can't believe how unbelievably powerful that would be, particularly for, for somebody in that, in that uh, part of the company. That's exactly right. In fact, FDA uses us specifically for this, right? In production, they, they analyze all the promotional marketing material that's submitted into the FDA. Uh, and they're using literally this platform to analyze that data. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it, it, and it, so it can operate, if you will, at scale, right? Because they're look, not just one company, but all companies, right? So actually, I'm sure that's going to be one of the questions people may ask. When you talk about at scale, what are you talking about for numbers? Are these, what size can you deal with? So our, our, our largest system to date uh, that's in production uh, is, has uh, just a hair under 12 billion objects in it. So you think about a document, you think about, you know, a file data, you know, pieces, you know, different documents, right? Files, if you will. 
um, this one is managing 12 billion records inside the system with less than one second results in search time. So it can handle huge amounts of data, but it can also handle you know small amounts too. It's not it's not limited. It doesn't have to be like that. It's not. It's designed to be able to work for anybody and everybody, no matter what your needs are. And it's you know, Brian. I just want that to sink in a little bit. When you talk about billions of data points, think about that in comparison to how many clients or customers do we have that we're working with that they have hundreds or thousands of documents and they can't find what they need. Right. I mean, that's just incredible to me. And I think about, I'm heavily involved in a number of merger and acquisition um, groups, as well as some of our clients have, have either bought compounds or um, they've absorbed other com companies. There's lots of data out there that nobody's ever going to look at. Right. Well, maybe you don't need to look at it. Maybe what you need to do is index it across it. And then when you need to find something specific, let the AI do that for you. Absolutely. Right. You know, that, that's, a, that's a huge concept if you think about that, particularly when you're pulling that data in. Yeah. And the nice part is much of that old data is in paper format. Well, what if you scanned all that stuff in? One of the nice things about this is the application will actually OCR that document on the way in. So you may have scanned documents. If you have a, a third-party service that did that scanning, you could actually OCR it on the way in so that it, it actually will do the indexing on those documents. Sure, and I can even show you an example how deep that goes. So I'm just gonna search for example on baseball player here, right? I quoted it, I'm gonna do an image search. So it's literally searching for images. Okay, and what you're gonna see here is you get back a bunch of images that came back within the system that have to do with baseball. I'm gonna click on one of them here, this one in particular. You're gonna see that there were predictions that were being made on that. But what's important is, so this text, right, that's here, that was also picked up and it was analyzed and it became part of the index, right? So we are, whether it's documents that were scanned in, you know, that are all image only, PDFs, if you will, right? Never, never been OCR. We automatically OCR everything that comes into the system. So it's just part of the process. And so all that becomes textual based, it becomes search based. And you mentioned, you know, in the M&A space, huge space, right? You buy a company, you buy a product, you ingest all this content, it comes into the system. Now what do you do, right? The knowledge workers didn't come with it. You just got the data. How do you interpret and understand that? How do you apply that data to your standards, to your organization standards? By being able to run it through a system like this, you can now have an index where you can do that type of mapping. You can use the AI intelligence within the platform to then drive and sort and push that system uh, that that information that came in into the appropriate source systems where you want them to go as well so there's just so many different ways that you could approach this well and i think that's where the match was made in heaven between what we do on the content repository side and what doxonomy does on the analytics around the documents using ai because we can actually put those systems together that can be a central repository that dumps it back into your legacy systems or your or your production level systems Instead of having to migrate or change those systems, we can actually be a conduit to put things into those systems Absolutely. as opposed to manually entering that data. Yep, that's right. Excellent. Um, well, you know. Uh, you know what, Brian? We, we actually just did a demo for a customer a couple of days ago. And one mm -hmm. of the things that impressed me about that demo was the analytics that you guys did on things. Can you just show a little bit of the, the analytics that you, you have in the system? Sure. So you, yeah. So so the system itself, everything that gets crawled and gets processed and analyzed, also ends up into what what you might think of as a data lake, right? A, a huge repository of of information. And there's ways to visualize that, right, within this UI. And of course, you can go beyond that and point powerful, you know, uh, BI type tools on top of the system. We've designed it to be able to to do that. But let's let's do a, a simple search here. Um, let me search on the word pain. So we're going to get a lot of hits back for this because pain is very relevant across most of the documents. Um, but what we can see here is in all these different document types, we've got prescribing information guide here. We've got a video that came back. We've got a lot of different stuff that's in here, over 10,000 results uh, that are coming back. We can visualize the results of that into 
you know, a graphical form. And this is all configurable. For demo purposes, we've thrown a few up. So here are the top countries, you know, um, here are the top extensions, you know, inactive ingredients and things like that. And I guess this is all, uh, you know, something that you can interact with. So you could say, for example, okay, well, I want to query on the United Kingdom. So let me go ahead and click on that. And it will readjust and the results change, right? We drop down to 5,000 results, but we're not talking about documents anymore. If we go back to the list, there are the documents, but what we're talking about here are the actual intelligence and data points that have been extracted out of the content. So you're being able to now visualize data in a whole different way, interact with it, and you're not even dealing with those unstructured pieces of, of content that exist anymore. You're dealing with it as if it were structured. I think what's incredible about this, Brian, is that for those people watching, understand the fact that we didn't configure anything to do this. This is already built into the system to show you those insights right out of the gate from doing that simple query. That's the power of what you could potentially have out of doing some of this. Absolutely. And of course, when you do have results, Let's say you have a list of results that are important. You can move that into, you know, grid format. So we have the ability to, to bring up grids and we could, you know, increase, you know, how we want that grid, you know, to work. So we can bring more results back. Uh, we can export all of those results. You can add the columns that you want here. Right now we have, you know, just uh, a few columns, but we could say, for instance, I want to group by the class. So then I could roll up my classes. So here I've got my SMPCs and my pills in this particular case, but you can sort of interact with this. And then if you need to export that to Excel uh, or dump it out to like a common uh, delimited list or a JSONL list, you can export this data for consumption and use. And again, you're not exporting documents, you're exporting data about those documents. And this is all fully you know, configurable by the user at the time of query as to what you want to have show up here. We had a question come in, uh, Brian, around how long does it take to set up the index? How long did the index process take? So to deploy the platform into an environment and get it up and running, uh, you can be up. It literally, it never works out this way because of IT. Okay, I'm sorry, but there are rules, right, that you go by. But it technically can be up and running in an hour. The whole system ships is what we call a virtual appliance. Once it's up and running and turned on, to configure a connector is quite simple. So you go in here, uh, we would go and say to our crawler section, um, I'll open one, one up that we already have here, so like this, but you would add a new one, give it a name, fill in some information about it, set some security, how often do you want it to run, point to what you want to point to and save it. Once that's done, all you do is uh, deploy the agent appropriately, hit go, and it starts crawling. Now, the time to run the index, how long will it take to crawl over all the data? That's a magic science, I'm sorry, because sometimes uh, you know, you're crawling terabytes or petabytes of data, but there is a way of calculating out how long that will take. If it's a simple system, a you know, uh, few hundred thousand documents, you can get across that you know, pretty quickly, like in a day or so. It'll index everything and process it. It crawls quite rapidly. It's, it's, it's very efficient in the way that it goes out and does what it does. Well, and I think, Brian, to your point, if you have a large volume of documents that we need to crawl, we can work with you based on the calculations that Brian's team has already put together, and we can allocate and orchestrate the size of the environment that it would take to do it. Obviously, it's just based on how much you want to spend on doing that initial crawl. But I think the subsequent crawls to keep it up to date are minimal at that point. Minimal, minimal because then you're doing delta calls, calls right? What, what was deleted, what was added, what was changed? And you're just monitoring you know, those, those effects. The curse, we call it the curse of the initial crawl, right? Is always the toughest because you got to touch everything, right? It's the first time, it's, it's learning. Uh, but it is very efficient, it's very fast, um, and it is very scalable. Uh, like I said, we've crawled, you know, at, at the FDA, I forget how many millions and millions of documents that we've crawled, the full amount, um, but it's, it's a huge amount. And we were able to crawl over all of that data uh, pretty quickly. If you were to put it into a linear timeline and how long it took to crawl, we probably got over it in about 30 days, all of it you know, the first crawl, 
Uh, some of that was due to the way they wanted to crawl. We did it in, in segments and then we analyzed and we were a little more methodical. It's up to it's up to you. It's up to the customer and how they want to do it. The system is uh, is is sort of uh, designed in a way that it can accomplish whatever you come up with. We're always trying to keep it granular so that we can configure anything that gets thrown at us. We had a question come in, Brian, around what classification types are supported now. Um, is that what connectors that we have now? Is that is that where you're uh, at? I think it's. Well, if you're talking about the different kinds of document types that we classify today, ah, okay. uh, we, we've got 1571s, 72s, 3674s, you know, you can see this is, it's a fair amount about anything that would be in the public domain that we've been able to go out and work on and, and crawl. Uh, but like I said, to add a new, a new type, we just need samples, okay? So if you have a few samples, you know, let's just say a hundred samples, we can go in, we can add a new class, we can save it, we upload those samples, and then we click train. In about 30 minutes, it'll train a new model, and now those will be incorporated into, into the training for classification. Brian, we only have a couple minutes left, but there's two other questions I thought if we can hit those very quickly, it'd sure. be great. One is, how is security managed to ensure that when you search, you're only searching things you have the ability to see? How do you deal with that? So we uh, two different ways. Currently, uh, the connectors have a security component built on top of them. So you apply it at the connector level. You can have as many connectors as you want to a source system and it integrates back to LDAP, right? So your Active Directory, whatever. So you it'll ingest the groups and, and, and however it's already set up within your infrastructure and then it will be applied that way. That's the sort of simplest way to answer that. Another question that came is when it crawls other content sources, are you pulling the actual documents into your solution? And then rerunning the and then rerunning the crawler periodic the update for source changes. Uh, no, we 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 grab a copy of the original content in order to do what we need to do initially. Uh, it's not kept unless you choose to keep it. There is an option to keep it. The default is to not keep it. You can keep a native copy in the system if you want, uh, but the default is to not. It points to the to the source. Um, from that point on, everything gets hashed. And then we're looking at hashes when we, if we need to re re pull a, a piece of content. So, great. We may do a future um, webinar where we talk about that instance that Brian just talked about in that particular question. The concept of that: why would we pull documents, and why would you have that? At some point, when you want to um, archive legacy systems, that would be a main thing. So, think about that. And what we'll do is maybe in the future do another webinar directly on that topic and talk about how that can be, and along with that same topic is, how do we mitigate your migration efforts by using a tool like this? Um, I think we're coming up on time. Uh, Roy, any final comments that we have? Uh, no, uh, that, that was uh, fantastic. Before I see here, I can answer it probably real quick. What about yeah. content in email or file systems, file share systems? Um, we actually, uh, we have connectors to crawl email system. Uh, so we can crawl email and we, process the email and all the attachments that are in the email and we go nested down and keep that relationship uh, and file shares. Yeah, we absolutely crawl file shares. We can crawl them and, and, uh, and do that. Well, there's one more. What's the infrastructure requirements on premise or cloud? It can be either or. So uh, we run on premise if you want, or we can run in your cloud of choice, or uh, we can host it through court square. It's it, it Whatever your requirements are, we can meet them. We can work with you guys. Easy. Well, folks, I think we're at time now. I think uh, I, we really want to thank all of you that were participating. We love the questions. Uh, keep them coming if you have other ones. Um, we've got at the end of the, the slide deck, we've got the um, info there to send us the questions. We can answer those. But we really appreciate you guys coming on board and, and working with us. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.